So in this video we're going to deal with the mammalian oestrus cycle. Now, the, the GCSE version you will have come across before is quite straightforward. FSH leads to the production of oestrogen. And that in turn leads to the production of LH. We can now see that LH in itself will lead to the production of progesterone. Now there are secondary events that surround this, but ultimately LH leads to progesterone release. Here we've got progesterone. Now if we go back to the beginning, it's not actually FSH that starts the estrus cycle off. We can start with a, a second hormone, okay, and this is GnRF. And GnRF, which stands for gonadotropin releasing factor, that stimulates the pituitary to release FSH. So we've got an extra step added in right there. So GnRF increases the levels of FSH. FSH, as we saw before, leads to estrogen production, but actually FSH causes the follicle to develop, and that follicle releases estrogen. So we've got a follicle developing, leading to increased levels of estrogen. So we can just get rid of that step between FSH and estrogen. That's not really there anymore. Now, estrogen then decreases the production of GnRF. It stops GnRF production, so we've got a decrease there. This is an example of a negative feedback loop because the production of estrogen, which was caused by the production of GnRF, now stops GnR, GnRF release. So it's a negative feedback loop. Now if we move further down, oestrogen does stimulate the release of LH in the pituitary glands. We've got an increased level of LH. This is an example of positive feedback because oestrogen causes the production of LH. Then more oestrogen is released, more LH is released. So it's positive feedback occurring there. So you've got increased levels of oestrogen. Now, oestrogen itself also causes the uterus lining to develop. So that thickens. So we're increasing the thickness of the uterus lining there. Now, this uterus lining thickening is really important as it allows the fertilized egg to embed in the uterus lining and develop. LH also leads to ovulation, so the release of the egg. Now, in doing so, that kind of changes how we look at the rest of this because the empty egg follicle is now stimulated to develop into the corpus luteum. So the follicle develops into the corpus luteum. That corpus luteum will produce progesterone. So the corpus luteum will lead to the production of progesterone. So you've got increased levels there. And we can again get rid of the step between LH and progesterone because that's not really there. Progesterone also affects the uterus lining and that just maintains the thickness. So rather than building up, it just keeps it as it is, maintains that thickness. From here, we can start thinking about what the effects of progesterone are. So if we zoom out overall, progesterone as a hormone does a couple of things. Okay, Its main effect, if I come all the way around here, its main effect is that it decreases levels of GnRF. Now that's really important because progesterone being produced ensures that no more eggs start developing because if the, the egg does become fertilised, the last thing you want is extra eggs becoming fertilised because down the road, nine months down the road, you'll have an eight-month-old fetus potentially and a nine-month-old fetus all in the same uterus. That's definitely not good. So it decreases the production of GnRF, and in doing so, it decreases FSH and LH levels. So again, this is an example of negative feedback over the whole process. Now over time, normally, the progesterone levels will fall, and that negative feedback loop is removed, GnRF will start to be produced. Also, because progesterone levels will fall, the maintenance of the uterus lining will now stop. So in that circumstance, the maintenance stops and this negative feedback loop stops. That leads to the breakdown of the uterine lining. So we end up losing the uterine lining, so that can go. And it leads to the stimulation of GnRF. 
So we've got GNRF now being released, that stimulates FSH release, and the whole cycle starts again. Now in mammals, that's known as the menstrual cycle, because that's one month, men's being the, 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 the Greek for, for month. Uh, but in other organisms, it's just the estrus cycle. Now if we just zoom out and have a look at one of the graphs that you might expect to face on this process. You can see a few clear stages. If we try and follow the flowchart on the left and compare this to the diagram on the right, what we can see, if we start off initially, we can look at FSH. So FSH, which I've put in red here, FSH levels initially start to increase, and we can see that increase. As they increase, that leads to a corresponding increase in oestrogen, which I'm also doing in red here. Now, as oestrogen levels rise, you can see that the FSH levels have started to decrease, which if we go back over to our diagram over here, we can see that oestrogen is having a negative effect, negative feedback effect on GNRF, which is therefore not stimulating FSH production. Now, as oestrogen levels rise, we can also start to see an increase in the level of luteinizing hormone, or LH. So at high levels of, FS, of estrogen, we've got levels of LH also increasing. Now at very high levels of estrogen, you actually see this very strange effect where it stimulates FSH production. But equally, as estrogen levels decrease, FSH is naturally going to increase and LH will increase further. At this point, right here, we have ovulation. The egg is released right at LH's peak. Now, as soon as the egg is, re is released, you start to see that progesterone levels now rise. So we have our progesterone levels increasing here. Those progesterone levels rise immediately after ovulation and have a direct inhibitory effect on FSH and LH. So there's this negative feedback from progesterone on that. And also, which we didn't have in our original diagram, progesterone has a negative effect on LH, so it decreases LH stimulation at that point. Now, in this case, there's no pregnancy. So over time, the corpus luteum breaks down, and we see that progesterone levels will start to decrease. Estrogen levels will decrease as well. And we can just start to see the upturn right at the end, the upturn in FSH levels, which is occurring on day 28 as progesterone levels have reached their base. So overall, we can track the flow of hormones by using this graph, but just keep on relating them back to those main processes. We need to be thinking of negative feedback, positive feedback, negative feedback again.